Hello and welcome to Joy, Passion, and Profit, where our intention is to empower entrepreneurs to build companies that change the world. And this show is actually based on a lesson that I learned from my grandfather. And when I was approximately 10 years old, I remember a conversation I had with him in which I walked up to him and I said, Grandpa, you know, when I get older, I'm going to be rich. And he asked me, well, how are you going to do that? I said, I'm going to own my own company. He said, well, that's a great goal to have. And if you want to own your own company, I'm going to give you two lessons that if you learn these two lessons, I can assure you, you can become rich. He said, lesson number one, if you're going to be rich, you have to learn to think like rich people. He said, the only difference between rich people and poor people is how they think. He said, lesson number two, if you're going to be rich, you have to learn to listen. He said, because rich people will tell you how they got rich. So you have to listen to them and learn from them. That means reading their stories, learning from them, following in their footsteps. He said, if you do those two things, you too can be rich. And those two lessons have stuck with me my entire life. And so the intention of this show is to get you to listen. And so I bring on guests who can share insights and wisdom that can support you and empower you to become the best entrepreneur you can possibly be. So here's my question to you. Are you willing to listen? And joining me today is Chris Widener. And this guy's amazing. He is one of the top 50 speakers in the world. And he's in the, the speaking business, which I'm, I'm also in. And I'm really excited to kind of pick his brain a little bit. And so we're going to learn a lot from Chris. So at this time, let's introduce him to, on the show. Hey, Chris, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic, Michael. Thanks for having me. All righty. Well, looking forward to a great chat about the speaking business. But before we jump into that, I want to just kind of break the ice a little bit with a few icebreaker questions. So first of all, tell us where you're from and share a little bit about your family, whatever you feel comfortable sharing. So, uh, born and raised in Seattle, and uh, spent the first 50 years of my life in Seattle, and on my mother's 70th birthday, I called her up, and I was talking to her, wish her happy birthday, and, and at the end of the conversation, she said, oh, and by the way, I'm moving to Tucson, and I said, what are you talking about, moving to Tucson? She said, I've lived 70 years in the rain, I'm not going to die in the rain. So, she packed it up, she moved to Tucson, lived the last 10 years of her life in Tucson, and when I turned 50... I said, I've lived 50 years in the rain. I'm not going to die in the rain, and I'm going to beat my mom by 20 years. So I moved to Scottsdale, Arizona, and, uh, and got down here a few years back. Uh, three, I've been here three years now, and I love the sun, even in the middle of the summer. I know you're from Houston. The difference between Houston and, and uh, Scottsdale, not much in ter terms of temperature, but about 80% in terms of humidity. So uh, we got a real dry heat here, and uh, I love it here. It's great. Uh, I've got a beautiful wife. Uh, we got married a, uh, about eight weeks ago in uh, Florence, Italy. Oh, wow. And I have, uh, I have four children from my first marriage, a son and three daughters and four grandchildren. And I have two beautiful stepdaughters from my, my uh, second marriage. So great, uh, great to be down here. Uh, found a new love and am enjoying life. It's, it's great. Fantastic. Now, I'm sure there are many, but name a hero who has inspired you to be who you are? Boy, so many people I've had. I've had great mentors all along. I had some great high school teacher. I had a great college professor. I had a great mentor. My first mentor out of uh, business or out of um, uh, college in, in business was the CEO of Mars Candies, a little little company doing about twenty five billion dollars a year. And uh, but I think if I had to, you know, really think about a mentor, it'd probably be Jim Rohn. I spent the last seven years of Jim's life working with him. Uh, I wrote the Jim Rohn one-year program with him, which still sells today, uh, 17 years later after I wrote it. Um, and I wrote his last book called 12 Pillars. And um, he was a great guy, mentor, not only in the speaking business, um, but he gave me, you know, he gave me a real, a real door of opportunity that opened up into working with Zig Ziglar. I had a television show with Zig Ziglar. I think Zig is probably the greatest uh, person I ever met. Um, just a fantastic human being, great guy, loved his family, um, just a, a terrific guy, same guy on stage as he was off stage, and just fantastic, so really liked him a lot, he was a, a super good guy. Yeah, great, great role models, great role models. Now, yeah, for sure. Once again, I know there's going to be tons, but name a book that has allowed you to become the man that you are today. 
I think the book that I always I, I always start with. In fact, in in the book Twelve Pillars, there's a whole chapter on um, reading and the books you should read, and we list twenty books every person should read. And the first book that the guy, the mentor sort of assigns to the mentee is a book called The Magic of Thinking Big by Dr. David Schwartz. And so I always tell people it's just as easy to think big as it is to think small. If you're going to think, think big. Um, because there are, there's always small thinkers. You should be a big thinker. Absolutely. Agree 100%. Now, if you love movies, name one of your favorite movies. Boy, well, the one that just popped into my head immediately is Gladiator. I love Gladiator. It's a great movie. You know, um, there's, boy, I'm, I'm a real movie guy, right? In fact, I'm going to see a movie this afternoon. My, my wife is taking my oldest stepdaughter to the University of Alabama. They just uh, moved in yesterday. So I'm home and uh, I'm going to go see a movie at the end of the workday. I'm going to cut out a little bit early and go, go see a movie. But no, there's some really good movies out. But the, the first one that popped into my mind was, was Gladiator. You know, it, it just sort of depends on, on what you're, you're, thinking about, right? Are you talking about human relationships? Or are you talking about, you know, just action films? Are you talking about love? Are you talking about funny Christmas movies? Probably be better to do it like by genre or something like that. But, um, you know, the other day, it was funny, the other day, somebody said, you know, um, uh, sometimes you have to wait a long time in order to get something, even when you're long past due. And somebody said, um, you know, I think, he said Denzel Washington got passed over for, for uh, best actor for so long, they finally just gave it to him for Training Day. I said, are you kidding me? Training Day is the best movie. Of, that's my favorite movie of Denzel. I can watch that thing over and over and over again. It was like the best one. Well, and he, uh, he disagreed with me. He was amazing in that role. I'm a big movie buff, so I always you know what You know what makes me think that I like, what made me like that movie and made me realize what an amazing actor he is? Yeah. Denzel Washington is one of the most likable guys there is. Both, both on camera, he's played some just really likable characters, and off camera, I guess he's just a gem of a human being. But you didn't like him in that movie. You <laughs> wanted him to die by the end of the movie. That tells me... You're a good actor. It's kind of like, um, I don't know if you ever saw Mosquito Coast with uh, Harrison Ford, but Mosquito Coast, here he was, Han Solo, and the guy from Raiders of Lost, one of the most lovable characters of all time. And then by the end of Mosquito Coast, you hate the guy. And you're like going, this, he must be a really good actor to overcome all of the goodwill you have viewing him as Han Solo and Raiders of the Lost Ark to want him to die by the end of Mosquito Coast. That's, that's great acting. That's great. Yeah, that's great acting. Great acting. Now, there are some people who are pessimistic about the future, and there's others that are optimistic. So where do you fall on a spectrum between optimism and pessimism in general for the future? I am way too optimistic. Um, like, I probably am optimistic to a fault. Um, I, I, I just see good things all the time. I, I, I just think there's something good that can come out of everything and uh, probably to a fault. Um, I was just involved in, a, uh, in a, a startup here, and we had a guy that was, you know, had access to hundreds of millions of dollars, and he was going to fund the whole thing, and 99% and of his story checked out. Um, you know, his dad had been a very, very big businessman, ran around with billionaires, I, and then died and left a, a family trust. I met many of the billionaires that his dad ran around with in the whole run up to this business. And, um, and then uh, at the end, long story short, he pulled the plug. And what we found out was, was that, yes, there was a trust fund with hundreds of millions of dollars in it. But no, he did not control it. His mom did. And his mom wouldn't give him the money. And this guy was 45 going on 15. And the guys that were going to start the company with us, um, they, they got really frustrated. And they're like, oh, man, it ticks me off. We wasted six months. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's look at this positively. If we'd have found out he was a liar two weeks in, we wouldn't have put together this world-class team. We wouldn't have put together this world-class business uh, plan. We've spent six months building this whole thing out. Let's go reincorporate and go do it ourselves. And so that's what we did. We said, okay, see you later. No, no problem. We incorporated the next day. And uh, now we're out going and looking for 3 million bucks for the, for the business uh, from, from the, uh, some angels and some VCs. But one person will look at it and go, that sucks. We got led astray for six months. And I said, that's actually kind of cool because it gave us the time to build this whole thing out. 
Yeah, nice. It's all perspective. Yeah, it's, exactly. There is a different perspective. You can you can take anything and view it from this side, or you can view it from this side. You know that you know the old story. I'm sure about they put blindfolds on people and they took them to a zoo, and one of them grabbed the tail of the envelope and uh, elephant. The other grabbed the leg of the elephant. The other put the hands on the side of the elephant. And they said, "What's an elephant like?" And one said, "He's like a snake." The other said, "It's like a tree trunk." And the other said, "It's like a wall." Well, they all had only their perspective. Right. And so it, it's all about perspective. And, and the great thing is, is you can choose your perspective. Yes, firmly believe that. Now, last question. If I had a magic wand, and with this magic wand, you could create anything your heart desired, what would Chris Widener's life look like 10 years from now? Well, my first answer would be the the regular answer. I would create five more magic wands, but um, <laughs> you know what? You can have any three wishes. What's your third wish? Three more wishes. Right. Um, you know, my life is about impact. I realized early on. My dad died when I was four, and I realized early on that life is short, and life and and death is final, and you don't get a second chance here on earth, and so. Um, I've been really fortunate to make a lot of money and, and do some of those things. And, and, um, but I've also had a great chance to make an impact. And that's really what I want to do. In fact, you know, my books, I'm writing my 21st book. My, my 21st book is due at the end of this month um, to the publisher. And almost all of my books prior to this have been on success and leadership and motivation and influence. This is a book called Lasting Impact creating a life and business that lives beyond you. So 10 years from now, I'll be 53 or 63. And I want to be, I'll be 10 years closer to the grave, 10 years to the final breath. And I want to be 10 years closer to having uh, made an impact on so many people. So, you know, I've given 2,500 speeches all around the world uh, to crowds as large as 25,000 people. I've done so many stadium events, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 people all around the world. And, um, you know, 21 books, 13 languages, 3 million books in print, um, a million audio programs sold. Um, and, and that's great. And it's been success for me. But I'm kind of at a stage now where I want to train other speakers to do it. I want to, I want to help other speakers learn how to take their knowledge and their life story and impact other people. You know, I think it was 2007, Jim Rohn got the Master of Influence Award from the National Speakers Association. And I was there sitting at the table during the banquet and Jim was sitting to my left and, and uh, Mark Sanborn gave the award away and he was doing the introduction. There were 2000 speakers in the room and he asked a question of those speakers. He said, how many of you would say that Jim Rohn has had a significant impact on your life and business? And nearly two thirds of the hands, 13, 1400 people's hands went up and all of a sudden I did the math. Okay. Jim does X amount of engagements a year, reaching X amount of people, but now here's 1400 people. Let's call it 1500 for the math, 1500 people. If they do 50 speaking engagements each, that's 75,000 speaking engagements they give a year. And let's say they're, you know, whatever, a thousand people in each room you're talking about millions and millions and millions and millions of people you've impacted, not directly, but indirectly. And so it was really, it was a profound moment for me. I can still remember it like it was yesterday, sitting there, Jim was to my left and Mark was up there and I was watching and he asked the question. I looked back at the room and just all the hands that went up and I thought, that's what I want to be. I want to be the guy that not only has his own world, but impacts the worlds of everybody else. Yeah. Nice. You know, one of my one of my goals <clears throat> is to become a billionaire. And my definition of a billionaire is someone who positively impacts the lives of a billion people. Mm. And so before I leave this earth, I want to be able to say that I have mm. positively impacted the lives of a billion people in some way. So that's that's one of my goals. Now, well, you know, the funny thing is, Michael, you probably don't even know it or there's it's incalculable, really. Um, if you count second and third degree and fourth degree influence, it's incalculable, right? Um, you know, you've impacted somebody who impacted 100 people and those 100 people impacted 1,000 people. And, you know, you're probably already up to tens of millions of people. And you, yeah. and you, and you really can't even calculate it at this point. Right. But the, the intention, as you, as you mentioned, is to make an impact. 
Yeah. And that's what really drives me. So now, Chris, I want to give you an opportunity, though, to just kind of, we've kind of touched upon it, but, but tell the audience specifically what you do and how you do it. Well, I mean, in, in a general sense, I'm a speaker, an author. Um, I communicate information uh, to people uh, stemming from my life, from the lives of people that I've studied, the research I've done, and then um, the clients that I've served, the coaching clients. I've, I've had the great privilege of being mentored by some world-class business people. I've had uh, the great opportunity to coach a lot of world-class business people, pro athletes, and, and the like. And so um, my job is to create information that's communicated in such a way that it's engaging and, um, and important for people in changing their life and, and making a difference. So that's generically what I do. So I do it through speeches. Uh, I do it through audio programs. I do it through um, video programs. Uh, do it through books and articles and videos and, and all that kind of thing. I, I just launched the Chris Widener Speakers Academy uh, at WidenerAcademy.com. I, I put together 45 of the world's top speakers. Between the 46 of us, we've done a billion dollars in the speaking business and uh, 63 videos that teach speakers how to build a speaking business. So to me, uh, what that was, was me using my influence to corral 45 of the world's top speakers to give me 30 minutes to talk about very specific topics in building a speaker's business. So I get to impact people, but then I get to impact people who impact people. Nice. Now, obviously, you know, you're rated as one of the top 50 best speakers of the world. You've traveled the world. You've obviously made lots and lots and lots of money. So by society standards, you are someone who we would call successful. Right. Now, but my question to you is, how would you define success today? Because you've done it all. So how well, I would, I, I, it's the same way I've always done it. Success is not the overachievement in one area. It's the balanced achievement in all areas. Ooh. So, you know, people tend to focus on one area to the detriment of other areas. This is why you'll find a super rich guy who's had four wives, right? Very, very successful with money, not so successful with, uh, with a relationship. Um, or you'll find somebody who's totally ripped out, muscle bound, you know, totally, you know, runs marathons and dumber than a box of rocks, right? Or you'll find somebody who's very spiritual. They love God. They treat people well. They're super kind. But they're broke as a joke. Um, and so what, what I say is, is that real success to, to, to be so far behind the curve in a really important area. Your intelligence is an important area. Your wealth is an important area. Your health is an important area. All these areas are important, but we tend to let them go so that we can look good in one particular area. And so I've never viewed success as, as being the richest guy in the room. Um, in fact, I was talking to a guy, um, we were talking about a, a well-known speaker who I consider to be kind of a charlatan. And I was talking to another very well-known speaker and, and, um, and I said, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't think a lot of what he says is true. I feel like he's, you know, less than honest. And, and this friend of mine says, yeah, but Chris, he made $10 million last year. And I said, this guy's name, I said, yeah, but the mob made $10 million last year, like making 10 million. There's lots of people make $10 million. It doesn't mean that you're successful. What makes success is being honest, kind, wealthy, fit, you know, intelligent, growing. To me, that's success. It's not the overachievement in one area, the balanced achievement in all areas. Yeah. And in one of your talks, you mentioned that all people basically want the same things. And I truly believe that. And I'm actually writing a book titled The Four Pillars of a Joy-Filled Life. Mm. And those pillars are inner peace, dynamic health, great relationships, and financial abundance, which simply yeah. means that you have enough money that you're not stressing out over it. So what were you talking about when you said all the people want the same things? What were the things you were talking about? Well, I, I actually do that. I agree with those four things. I actually do that as a setup to another point. Okay. Um, but I use that in my speeches as a setup. So I say, you know, um, everybody wants the same thing. Let me pro prove it to you. How many of you would like a million dollars in the bank? Every hand goes up. How many of you would like to live a long, healthy life? Every hand goes up. How many people want your children to grow up to be productive members of society? Every hand goes up, right? So I prove to them by looking around the room, yeah, we all want the same thing. Then I say, and we live in a country where you can do anything you want to do. So if it's true that everybody wants the same thing, 
and yet some people do it and some people don't. What's the difference between the people who do it and the people who don't? And the payoff is it's a matter of choice. So I actually, I, that's not really the, the, the teaching in and of itself. It's really kind of the setup so that I get people to agree that, yeah, we all want the same thing. But yeah, it's right. If we all want the same thing and we live in a free world, why is it that some people don't get it? Yeah. And it's because they don't make the choices that, that accrue to become the, the sum of, you know, all of it put together. Now, it's my experience that most successful people, however you define successful, have experienced some type of adversity or even tragedy in their lives. So did you have an experience that may have triggered you to begin your own inner journey of transformation? Sure. And I think it's ongoing, actually. Um, my, my upbringing was horrific by almost anybody's um, measurements. You know, my dad died when I was four. He was making $90,000 a year in 1969. He had $30,000 worth of life insurance. And my mom had to sell the house uh, that her, her mortgage payment was $400 a month. That house last sold in 2013 for a million eight. And she had to sell it because she didn't have the money. That began a downward spiral, 28 homes, 11 different schools, shipped off to live with relatives twice, started drugs in the sixth grade, uh, made most of my money growing up, betting the horses at Long Acres Horse Track, you know, really bad upbringing. And when I finally got my life turned around, I thought, you know, how do I become better? What did I learn from that? There's lots of things I learned from that. Um, some people would go to 11 different schools and they would hate it and they would become introverted. I realized that I needed to be able to learn how to develop friendships very quickly. And that's what happened. You walk into a new school, you got to develop new friendships. So I'm really good. I can come right in. I can build rapport very easily. So that challenged me to, to get better. You know, over the course of my, my business career, I've had some failures. I've had some great successes and I've had some great failures. And you learn what works and what doesn't work. And then, you know, I was married for 27 years and ended up going through a divorce. And, and uh, nobody gets married to get divorced right? And, and there's nothing good about it. It's, it's, it's unfortunate. And so, you know, I took a number of years after that. I went to counseling. I thought, I want to I get better. I want to heal myself. I want to become a better man. Um, I certainly, when I get remarried, I want to make sure that I'm a better man because my figuring was if my first wife didn't like it, my second wife won't like it either. So I figured, you know, I better figure some things out. And so, um, you know, that's the most recent thing or setback, but people experience that in a wide variety of things. Their, their kids get into drugs or they lose a relative or their spouse dies or they go bankrupt or they get cancer. I mean, the world is filled with all sorts of problems. You know, um, I know this isn't a faith broadcast, but um, one of the things Jesus said that I just find fascinating, he said, in this world, you'll have trouble. Yep. There has never been a more true statement than that. In this world, you'll have trouble. And, and it wasn't, if you're really rich, you won't have trouble. It was in this world, you'll have trouble. And even rich people have trouble. I mean, uh, you know, right out of college, I was a youth director and I worked at a church in Northern New Jersey uh, in a very, 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 very wealthy town. Whitney Houston lived in our town. Mike Tyson was in the town just south of us. And uh, I hung around with lots of wealthy people and they had problems. They had marital problems. They had children problems. They had health problems. They had financial problems. Um, problems are part of life. And then you just have to choose. Am I going to learn something from my problems? Or am I going to let my problems drag me down and bury me? Yeah. And <clears throat> our, so our stories are very, very similar. As a matter of fact, as a result of myself going through a divorce, a bankruptcy, a foreclosure, a deep state of depression, I was actually homeless for two years living out of a car. And I actually wrote a book called Adversity is Your Greatest Ally. Mm. How to use life challenges as stepping stones to live the life of your dreams. Yeah. And yeah. so what I've learned as a result of my own journey, and it definitely has a spiritual component to it, is that I believe everything does happen for a reason. And if we're willing to look deeply enough, there's always a gift and a lesson in mm. every adversity that we experience. And so I've taken all those adversities that I just mentioned and they, each one has shaped me into the man that I am today. Yeah, so absolutely. If, if you were to ask me, Mike, if you, could you go back, if you went back, would you change anything? I would say, no, I couldn't change anything because it would change me. Yeah. It's what made you, you know, I look back at that and I think, you know, um, what would have happened if I'd have had a great upbringing and my dad would have still been alive, I probably would have turned out great, but, but it wouldn't have been the life that I have now. 
Yeah. And, you know, as, as you were talking, I was thinking of the old Les Brown uh, comment. I'm sure you're a huge fan of Les, as am I. Uh, you know, a setback is just a setup for a comeback, right? You know, and for most people, a setback is the end. But if you're smart, a setback is just a setup for a comeback. All right. I've got, I've got to share my quick Les Brown story. Okay. So Les Brown comes to Houston and he's speaking at my church. And it just so happens that my minister and I were pretty close. And I said, look. I've just written this book. Can you just make sure Les Brown gets it? So I wrote a book back in the 90s called Brothers Are You Listening? A Success Guide for the 90s. Mm. And the book targeted specifically to men of color. It was a personal growth and development book specifically for men of color. So anyway, he gives Les Brown the book. And I had my phone number in there, whatever. Well, I get home from work one day and I've got my, my answer machines blinking. I hit the answering machine. And the young people are going, what's an answering machine? <laughs> that, that tells you how long ago it is, right? But it's Les Brown on my answering machine. Wow, I hope you saved it. I don't, I don't have it. I'm so upset. I had a voicemail from Zig Ziglar I wish I would have saved. So anyway, he, he leaves this message. And um, I'm sitting here and I'm just, man, I'm just elated, right? And so I finally, I called him back. He gave me his number. I gave, I called him back and he and I started this conversation. And it turns out that I think it was one of his other aunts that actually read the book uh -huh. and told him to make sure that he read the book. Uh -huh. He said, my aunt read the book. She loved it. So she made sure that I read it. And so we had this little conversation going. And again, this was before I really, I was just now starting my speaking career. But just the fact that he returned my call. Oh, yeah. And he was a guy that I was looking up to as a speaker. It's just, you know, one of those special moments that I'll treasure for the rest of my oh, life. Yeah, that's great. Pretty, pretty amazing. That's now, great. a friend of mine said this. He said, the only difference between successful people and those who aren't successful is this. Successful people have ways and methods to deal with the normal and natural resistance blocks and barriers that come up automatically unsuccessful people get stopped by them. What are your thoughts on that? Well, one of my most famous quotes that people quote me on is that um, uh, success is not, the difference between successful and the unsuccessful is not the absence of obstacles, but the presence of perseverance. Yes. So uh, successful people have obstacles. Unsuccessful people have obstacles. So that's not the difference between successful and unsuccessful. It's the presence of perseverance that's the difference between successful and unsuccessful people. Successful people persevere. Successful people say, I'm going to try one more time. I'm going to try one more way. And unsuccessful people say, see, I told you it wouldn't work. Yeah. So what advice would you give to someone who is currently paralyzed by fear? and don't know how to move through it. What, what advice would you give to that person? Well, there's an easy answer and there's a tougher answer. There's a shorter term answer and a longer term answer. The one will work if it works. If it doesn't, I would move on to the second. I'd say the first thing is start really small. Um, if you're afraid to swim, don't just jump into the four feet of water that comes up to your shoulders because it's just gonna panic you, right? Just get into your ankles and then turn back around and walk out again. Like just a small victory is all you need sometimes, right? Um, and I know there's, in, in, in my world, uh, our world, the success world, there's different, you know, do you incrementally or is it massive action? You know, Tony Robbins says, take massive action. Well, what if you can't? I mean, there's certain times that you can't, um, but incremental works just as well. It just takes a little bit longer. And um, if, if you really have some gripping fear, I would say work with a psychologist, work with a coach. Um, I know that there's coaches that specifically work on overcoming fear and things like that. So work with a coach, um, spend the money. But uh, if, if taking some incremental small actions doesn't work, you just can't get yourself to do it, invest the money and get a coach. Yeah, and see, and you said a couple of things that really stand out. One is not to be afraid to ask for help. Mm. And specifically for men, because I think for men, the three most difficult words that we can ever say is, I need help. Yeah. And so being willing to say, I need help, opens the door for major transformation. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear you acknowledge that. I mean, here you are a guy that's successful per se, but you're not afraid to say, you know what? I might need some help. I ask for help all the time. Yeah, and like, it's important. 
all the time. I, I got friends I call upon. I got, you know, I mean, how do you think I put 45 speakers into my speakers academy? I called them up and I said, hey, will you do this for me? And all of them said, absolutely, I'd love to, no problem, it's great. And a lot of people would just never ask for anybody to contribute or help or, or anything like that. Um, I'm just about, to, I'm just about got my 501c3 to start a, a nonprofit. And I am already planning on calling lots of people and asking for money. And I know that a lot of people are gonna do donate some money to this nonprofit to make a difference. And right. so that's asking for help. It's asking for very tangible, physical, monetary help. Yeah, and, and as simplistic as it sounds, it is still possibly the most difficult thing for us to do. It's hard for people, yeah, especially men. I think you're right. It's, it's to ask for, it's for, ask for help. Now, so, so Chris, tell me this. Do you have any daily practices that you do that help keep you motivated? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I read every single day. Um, I spend some spiritual devotional time every day. Uh, I try to make sure that I'm praying. Uh, try to make sure that I'm um, filled with gratitude. I try to be thankful for things. Um, I feel like your outer life is driven by your inner life. So intellectually, emotionally, spiritually drives physical, um, you know, the physical world. And so I try and make sure that I do that. Uh, relationally, I try to make sure I spend time with my wife every day and in more meaningful moments. Um, uh, I, I am also, I try to, I try not to be too busy. Um, and I know some people can just go, 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 go. And I, I look at some people's lives and I just go, I can't do it. I need time. I need downtime. I'm, I'm a slower paced person. Some people reading my resume may not, may not think that, but, um, I, I really am. I'm a slower paced person. I'll, I work from home, obviously, and there are times during the day I'll just go in and out of my office and I'll just go in and lay down on the bed and, and kind of just read a little bit. I need to just sort of lower the, the thing. And then I'll come out. I do a lot of these interviews. This is my third interview just today. Uh, and then I have my own two podcasts that I do. So um, I need breaks and I, I need regenerative time for my mind and my emotions and those kinds of things. So practicing that is is important for me, at least. Yeah, I think... A lot of people may not realize it, but speaking is draining. Absolutely. <laughs> it's draining, especially when you're putting your heart and soul out to people. You, it may appear that you're just out there talking. No, there's a lot more to it that when you're sharing yourself that way, it literally takes a lot in a good way, though. But it, 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 you have to regenerate. You have yeah. to take some time. to. For me, one of, the, one of my favorite things to do when I'm just in chill mode is I read Calvin and Hobbes comic strips. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nothing like it. The, that comic strip is something that I can, I'll, I'll sit there and I'll be reading it and I'll literally be crying. Yeah. Uh, it's so funny, but it, it really just sort of calms me, just puts me in this space of serenity and peace. And I just love it. It, it, it yeah. pulls me away from thinking about stuff or writing and, it's a great way for me to, to, to unwind. And like yourself, I, I have a, a daily meditation practice. Um, matter of fact, I, every morning, that's one of the first things I do is I spend time in quiet contemplation and just, just in the silence, just connecting with myself and just really planning out my day and, and just making sure that, you know, I've got a goal of where I'm gonna, what I'm going to do and accomplish that day. So just a mm -hmm. few things to kind of keep me, keep me going. Yeah, absolutely. So, so now let's let's talk about the speaking industry, which is okay. your your specialty. So my first question in this area is, how did you get involved with speaking? Well, I started speaking right out of uh, college because I'd had such a crazy upbringing. People wanted to hear the story, and so I started out speaking to high schools, summer camps, junior highs, colleges, universities, and the like. And then as I got older, it navigated uh, more over towards um, adult. Um, audiences, um, time management. I did time management for a few years. I did a thing called the Ultimate Time Management Seminar. And then I really focused in on what I'm most passionate about, which is leadership. Um, and then from there, uh, I ended up ghostwriting for John Maxwell. Um, and from there, I ended up um, working with Jim Rohn and Zig Ziglar and writing my own books and, and all that kind of stuff. That's sort of the trajectory. Now, so you, you mentioned, obviously you've written several books. So did you go to school for writing or did you just- I did not. I went to school for youth and family work. I wanted to go work with, um, with at-risk kids. 
And uh, it ends up, I never worked with any at-risk kids. I ended up moving to this town in New Jersey. I was working with kids that some of them made more money than me mm. from their trust funds. <laughs> now, it's been said that fear of public speaking is the number one fear most people have as a speaker. Now, you've been speaking a very long time, but I want you to try to go back a little bit when you were first starting out. How did you move through that initial fear to become a speaker? It's really not a fair question to ask me because I have never been fearful of talking. Um, my mother, my mother said to me one time after I really started making a lot of money speaking, she said, people pay you to do what I told you to stop. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, pretty much. Um, no, remember in high school, the kid who, um, uh, remember the kid who came on the announcements right after, right after home class started the buzzer beeped and then, and then the intercom came on and said, please stand for the plates of allegiance. And you know, today for lunch, we're having fish sticks and tater tots with a side of macaroni salad. That was me, my junior and senior year. That was me. Um, and then I played basketball my first two years of college. And then I transferred to another college and I knew that the coach was never going to keep a junior transfer when he could keep a, a, a freshman who had four years ahead of him. So I decided to, um, I decided to try out for the in-house announcer for the college basketball games. You know, the guy that does the starting lineups and, and calls the game and, and that kind of thing. And it's funny because, um, for seven years when I was growing up, from age 11 to 18, I was a ball boy for the Seattle Supersonics. So before I turned 18, I went to 750 NBA games because even before I was a ball boy, my mom and dad had four front row tickets to the Seattle Supersonics that they paid $12 a ticket for. Boy, wouldn't you like to pay $12 for front row seats? <laughs> literally feet on the hardwood, right? Um, and so the announcer for the Seattle Supersonics was a guy named George Tolles. He'd been the guy for years and years. And so like six of us show up in the stadium that day um, and it's a big empty stadium. And they said, all right, we're just going to have, here's a sheet. It's got two rosters on it. We want you to just do, you know, stand up for the pledge or stand up for the national anthem. Here's your starting lineups, you know, welcome them to tip off, whatever you want to do. And uh, they said, who wants to go first? And I said, I'll go first. And I had this tape of George Tolles because I'd heard him do this 750 times. And I literally stepped right up to the mic. I hit the thing and I said, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and welcome to the Seattle Supersonics. You know, and I just did the whole thing right on down. And, and everybody kind of went like this and I got the job. So um, I, I, it's kind of an unfair question to ask a guy like me because it, it is a natural gifting. It's, it's never anything I've had to work at. Um, I work at honing my craft. So, you know, I'm adding things to my speeches and when I'm doing it, I'm watching the audience, I'm measuring feedback and if it's no good, out it goes. There was a time about six, seven years ago, I, I can't even remember what it was, but it was funny. I mean, it was, I thought it was funny and it was a joke or a twist of words or something and I did it like six or seven times and nobody laughed and it was, it was weird because I would literally say it and nobody would laugh and I'd think to myself, what are you guys, stupid? That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but then I dumped it, right? I'm, I'm like, that doesn't work. So out the way, you know, out the door it goes. So I hone my craft, but it's, it's really pretty easy for me to, to do it. Um, so I've never had any fear. I'll tell you a funny story. I was speaking at Rupp Arena, University of Kentucky, 17,500 people. And uh, it was a big event. And um, the CEO of the company was out on stage giving the, my introduction. And, you know, those big events, they got meeting planners and they were wearing earphones with the pieces and they're talking to each other and they got clipboards and everything right down to the minute. And this guy's, you know, my intro is about a minute long. And he's about 30 seconds into it. And I look at the woman who's my handler. Her job is to pull back the curtain and I walk on the stage in front of these 17,000 people. And about 30 seconds into it, I look at her and I go, uh, I, I, I don't think I can do this. I'm, I'm really, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. I'm, 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 and she goes, are you kidding me? And I went, nah, I'm going to be good. <laughs> and she goes, I can't believe you did that to me. Because he was just about done with my intro when I started this. So now I've never had a problem with it. Now, with that being said, though, can you remember a time where you actually bombed as a speaker? No. <laughs> I hate to say it. I mean, you know, the way I look at it is, and it, it could sound like ego, but I'm really good at this. And, and I tell people that if you hire me to speak, you're going to get a world-class speech. Um, if you hire me to sing, 
not so much. You, in fact, you would never hire me to sing again. If you hired me to paint a picture, never going to work, right? There's certain things I am really not good at, but I'm really pretty good. Certainly times that I've not done as well, but I'm really good at it. And I've worked very hard at it. Um, I can't remember any time I've ever really bombed. Okay. Now, I've noticed that over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of emphasis about vulnerability as a speaker. Mm -hmm. And Brene Brown has really focused her talks around this topic, yeah. if you know who she is. Yeah. So how important is vulnerability to you in your talks? I had, a, I had a minister friend of mine tell me once, a minister should never admit any faults. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, the, the congregation needs to see that you are strong and conquering and victorious. And I said, absolutely not. They need to see that you suffer failure and struggles just like them, but are still victorious and conquering and, you know, whatever. And, um, and I think there's a lot of people that feel that way, that I need to be the strong one. And I'm not, you know, I, I do a lot. I do 10 podcasts a week, probably 10 interviews, radio interviews, whatever. And I always tell people, I'll talk about anything you want to talk about. You want to talk about my failures or talk about my failures because failure isn't failure if you learn something from it. And I've always been pretty good at learning something from it. So that's what vulnerability as a speaker is, is it's opening people up to your world and helping them understand that you learned something from it. Um, now, I don't think that, I think there's a, I think there's oversharing, right? You know, I think you can overshare, but I think if you give some basic details um, and, and, and the focus is not on woe is me, but the focus is on here's how I got through it. Um, I think those things can be even more transformational than a regular talk. Yeah. And, you know, I listened to a couple of your, your talks and what I experienced from you was an authenticity. Mm, thank you. Uh, as a speaker, I didn't get that, you know, cause some, some motivational speakers have this, they want to project this high energy. I'm invincible, blah, 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 blah. And there's, there's this superficialness. Mm -hmm. that as a speaker, I, I pick up on. I didn't get that from you. I really, I really got, here's a guy, number one, he cares about his audience. That, that's one of the things I picked up. Yep. You, you care about your audience. You care about your message. And again, there was just an authenticity to your speaking, which I, I really admired. And so I think it's important, that, as you just said, that we don't have to be these um, per perfect human beings. And to, to really make an impact, I think, Vulnerability is a big part of that without being, you know, overly emotional, I guess. Yeah. Well, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll note two things. First of all, thank you very much. Um, I was asked to come give a speech at a, a big speakers conference and, um, and they asked me to give a keynote and I gave the keynote and, but they didn't tell me, like, I thought I was just being asked to give a keynote. So I gave my keynote. And then the guy that had asked me in, there's 400, 500 people in the audience all trying to learn how to become speakers. He came out and he said, okay, Chris, I didn't tell you this, but we brought you in because we want our audience to see a great keynote speech. And now we're going to deconstruct it. And so I was actually a lesson and I didn't know, and he, probably good that I didn't know because, you know, um, but he said, so he said to the audience, first of all, how would you describe Chris's style? And the word that came out was conversational. Chris's style is very conversational. But then the second word was authentic. And so I appreciate that. Um, you know, when you talk about the, the second point I would make, it reminded me of a story. When I was in college, um, we, every person in my college was required to work with a nonprofit or do some sort of a, a give back to the community. So for a number of years, I worked on the Skid Road team in Seattle, Washington. So every Saturday night, we went down to Pike Place Market and a place called the Sunshine Inn. And we would go down there and play chess and checkers with homeless people and stuff like that. And I'll never forget the first time I went down there, we brought a bunch of sandwiches down there. And the guy that the, the faculty advisor said, look, here's what's going to happen. You're going to walk in there. There's going to be a bunch of people there. You're going to set up the sandwiches and they're all going to leave. And we're like, why would they leave? We brought them food. And he said, um, they're going to get all the other people. And uh, they're going to tell the other homeless people there's food there. And he said something I always thought was interesting. He said, um, I'm just one beggar telling another beggar 
where the food is. And I love that as a metaphor for speaking. Um, I'm not any smarter than anybody else, greater than anybody else, more ambitious than anybody else. I've worked hard. I've gotten really a lot of, I've gotten a lot of really lucky breaks to work with some legends where my career just catapulted further than I ever thought it would. Um, but in the end, I am a broken human being just like everybody else. And, and the more put together you look, I know well enough to know that it probably just means you're just compensating for the real brokenness. So I view my speaking engagements as I'm just one beggar who found the food and now I'm telling you how to get the food too. It, the food isn't mine. The food was given to me. Uh, I found the food. I didn't make the sandwich, um, but I found it and I'm going to help you find it too. And that's really my philosophy in regard to my speaking is I learned some really good information that has helped my life. Uh, it's helped get me through some hard times. And now I'm just going to pass it along to you, hopefully in a way that's engaging, hopefully in a way that make you laugh, um, may, a way that'll make you think, a way that'll challenge you, a way that'll encourage you. Um, but that's my philosophy. I'm just one beggar helping another beggar get some food. Fantastic. Great, great, great lesson there. Now, as a speaker, I know a lot of speakers struggle with defining their niche. You know, what is it that, that, they should really jump into. So how did you find your niche? As a What's interesting, I hired a speaking coach. Right. You know, um, when I, I do coaching for people who want to become speakers. I've got a year-long program. They get free admission to my Speakers Academy, those 63 videos from 45 speakers. Um, and I'm not asking anybody to do something I didn't do. I paid a guy like in 1996, I paid him 7,500 bucks for a year. 23 years ago, I paid him 7,500 bucks to coach me for a year. And, um, you know, so um, I think it's important to, to have somebody who can help you along, who can cut your learning curve, um, you know, all those kinds of things. And one of the things that he did with me was we were, we, he said, you can't just call yourself a motivational speaker. And I said, okay, well, what should I do? And he said, go to your bookshelf. And I went to my bookshelf and he said, what topic is most represented on your bookshelf? And I said, leadership. And he goes, so you've studied leadership? And I said, yeah. And he goes, have you ever been a leader? I said, well, I was quarterback on my football team, point guard on my basketball team, catcher on my baseball team. You know, I was in uh, student body government. I was class president in college. You know, so yeah, I've been a leader. I've been an entrepreneur. I've built businesses. I've led people. I've had staffs of people. So yeah, I've done it as well. He goes, great. You're, you've not only learned it, but you're a practitioner as well. Your new topic is leadership. And that's, that's how I got it. I mean, that's how I, that's how I shifted into it. Now, later on, um, when I was working with Jim Rohn International, Kyle Wilson, who was the president of Jim Rohn International, he was Jim's 18-year business partner. Um, Kyle said to me, he said, I think you ought to niche down even further. And I said, oh, yeah, how so? And he said, you ought to write and talk about influence. And I said, why? And he goes, I don't know anybody that has more influence than you do. You can pull your phone out. You can pull out billionaires, sports stars, rock stars, um, business people running major corporations. Like, you, you know everybody, senators, you know, governors and, and the like. And I had never thought about it. I had never thought, how did I go from 28 homes, 11 different schools, shipped off the river relatives twice, to having billionaires, sports stars, rock stars in my phone? I'd never, never, I'd never processed. I just lived my life. I've always been a hustler. I've always, you know, tried to be ambitious. And so I spent six months saying, why is it some people have influence? And that became my book, The Art of Influence, and my audio program, Winning with Influence. And so I niched down even further into influence. And then as I studied influence, I, uh, I noticed even more so that there's a school of thought that talks about influence as a technique, like what you do to influence people. And I niche down even further to what I call character-based influence, meaning it's not what you do to other people. It's who you are and whether or not people want to do business with you. And so it's an even deeper level than the technique-based. And it's about gaining trust, respect, admiration, and loyalty from other people. Now, as I'm listening to you, so many things are popping in my head, but one thing that just comes to mind for me is, it is my belief, and this is just Michael Taylor's belief, is that every human being has a divine purpose. Yep. And as a matter of fact, I believe our purpose is encoded in our DNA, and it is our responsibility to figure out what that purpose is. Mm. And so from your perspective, as a speaker, in your heart of hearts, do you feel that that's your purpose? Is to speak? Yes. 
Oh, absolutely. Unequivocally. My, my life mission statement is, is I will help. Um, I will use my writing and speaking skills to help people turn their potential into performance to succeed in every area of their life and achieve their dreams. So my end goal is to, is to turn people's potential into performance, succeed in every area of their life and to achieve their dreams. But the way I do it, the strategy is to use my speaking and writing skills. And so it's, it's built right into my personal mission statement that that's what I'm supposed to do is communicate um, by writing and speaking. And, and with that being said, one of the things I want to relay to the audience, and I think this is something that a lot of speakers, entrepreneurs miss out on, is meaning, having meaning in your life, having purpose in your life. Because you can have all the money in the world, you can have all the stuff, and I think the challenge that some people have is they seek fame over fulfillment. Mm. But what I hear you saying is there's a fulfillment that comes from within you that you experience in living your mission and sharing your purpose. And I think I want the audience to get that, that when you connect to that which is greater than yourself, and you can call it whatever you want to call it, when you have a sense of purpose and meaning, I believe that's the elixir of life. That's what, because, you know, for so many years, I chased money and stuff. <laughs> You know, and it wasn't until I lost all my stuff that I got to a point where I went, oh, there's something a little deeper. And it's something a little deeper, which is spiritual, I believe, is connecting to my authentic self, connecting to that which is greater than myself. And when I started putting those pieces together, I recognized that I have some specific gifts and talents that, were, that I was born with. And so speaking and writing are two of my gifts and talents. And to find our purpose, we take our unique gifts and talents and find out where the world needs those gifts and talents, apply those gifts and talents to make the world a better place, and we have fulfillment and meaning. Yeah, absolutely. Does, does that resonate with you? Yeah, it's interesting. You said you finally figured it out when you lost all your stuff. Um, I had a moment when I got all my stuff. So I had driven by this house for 21 years. Everybody in the Seattle area knows this house. Um, it's the, the front gate, Michael, is 500 feet long. It's brick pillars with wrought iron fencing, big giant gates, double, you know, the big double wide gates that open up. Um, big, beautiful mansion behind it, 1800 bottle wine cellar, swimming pool, pool house, half a mile of riverfront. It's right on the river. It's a spectacular place. It was built when I was 17 years old. In fact, I crashed my first car on the road in front of this house, 1968 Mustang. Um, for 21 years, every time I drove by that house, I stopped at the front gate and I'd say, I'm going to buy that house someday. I was 17 years old when it was built. When I was 38 years old, 21 years later, I bought that house. That house had a quarter mile circular driveway. And about two weeks after I bought the house, I poured myself a drink, probably a nice glass of scotch, and I decided to take a walk around the driveway. Now the driveway was sort of on a tilt. So when you got to the top of the circle, you were, you were actually kind of above the level of the house. You were looking back down at the house. And I looked back down at the house two weeks after I bought this house, well into the seven figures um, that I'd dreamed of for 21 years, I looked back at the house and I had a thought. And my thought was, now what? Oh, wow. It, it, I, it, I still remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> and, and that was 15 years ago. Now what? I got it all. I got this giant mansion, everything I wanted, drive beautiful cars. I'm, I'm traveling around the world. I'm getting world famous. I'm, I've got, you know, books selling you know, at the time in the hundreds of thousands before it became in the millions. And, uh, and I just realized, man, none of this really matters. Mm. You know, there's a, there's a thing going around. You've probably seen it. It's on like Goldcast or something like that. It's this guy. I don't even know who he is. He's a young guy and he, he got rich. He sold his company and, it, and he tells the story. He says, do you know what it's like to get rich instantaneously? He said, I knew that I was about to get, I can't remember the number, $150 million. And I opened up my bank account and I kept hitting refresh, refresh. And I had like 12 grand in my bank account. Refresh, 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 $150 million. Wow. And he went, and then I realized I'm still the same person. 
I still have the same problems. I still have the same fears. I still have the same insecurities. It's pretty powerful. You know, this guy, young guy, he looks like he's maybe 40, um, maybe even 35, and he made a fortune, and, and he realized it. The, it was the minute he got the money that he realized, I'm still, this, 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 didn't, take, this didn't take away any of my problems. <laughs> Took away my, my financial problems. I don't have to worry about, you know, if my, my transmission goes out in my car, but it didn't take away any of my other problems. Yeah, and so that's, that's a great segue into closing. Now, I just want to say thanks for sharing that because so many times we're, we're chasing the stuff, we're chasing the money, we're chasing the women, we're chasing the cars and all of that. But until, uh, one of my favorite quotes is, if you don't go within, you will always go without. Oh, I like that. You got to go within to connect to who you really are. You got to connect to your authentic self. And until you do that, something will always be missing. Mm-hmm. So, so Chris, I want to give you an opportunity now, just any closing thoughts you have to inspiring, uh, aspiring speakers who are thinking about getting into this industry. What are your thoughts? What would you like to share to them with them right now? I'll tell you a freaky story happened to me when I was like 22 years old. I was at a conference and uh, we were in this big room where a whole bunch of the conference attendees were. And uh, this is a, you know, I don't have many stories like this. this is one of these like psycho spiritual kind of weird interactions. And I was walking through and I saw a woman about 55 and a woman about 30. And they were obviously daughter and and mother. And the daughter's eyes went like this when she saw me. And her mom said, is that him? (laughs) And I'm going, "Uh, what? And, And she said, it is. And I'm like, what are you guys talking about? And the mom said, they were there at this conference. They slept in the same hotel room. And the mom said she woke up in the middle of the night last night and she saw the face of a man that she was supposed to tell somebody something. Wow. And, and, it, and it was your face. She woke me up in the middle of the night like this is the strangest thing that's ever happened to me. I'm like, all right. And so, so the gal's still standing there and her mom goes, well, tell him. <laughs> and she said, she said, I'm supposed to tell you, be a voice, not an echo. Oh, wow. And I have thought of that. I have thought of that. I mean, that happened when I was probably 23 years old. So I'm 53 now. For 30 years, that's been my mission. Be a voice, not an echo. And I would say it's, it's for everybody. You've got your own life story. You've got your own experience. You've got your own thoughts. You've got your own things that you can contribute to the world. Don't just take somebody else's stuff and throw it out there. Do your own thinking. You know, Mark Sanborn says that everybody should spend 15 minutes a day thinking. 15 minutes a day, and those of you who don't know Mark Sanborn, look him up. He's one of the most successful speakers of the last 30 years, former president of the National Speakers Association. And uh, 15 minutes a day, he takes a yellow legal pad and all he does is think and writes things down. And it allows him to come up with his own stuff and his own thoughts. And uh, whether you do that or something similar, doesn't matter. Um, but, but the point is, is to be someone who creates not just someone who redistributes um, and be a, you know, be a voice, not an echo. Mm, beautiful. Beautiful. Be a voice, not an echo. I love it. Well, my man, I just want to say thank you once again for sharing your wisdom with the audience. And I look forward to one day sharing a stage with you. I'm setting that intention right now. Yeah, thank you. And um, again, it's been an honor and a pleasure. And so how can people find out more about you and your coaching programs and things like that? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, if they want to coach with me personally, I only take 10 clients at a time. I usually have about six or seven that I take on at any given time. Um, You can reach me at widenercoaching.com. There's a video there, um, me talking, describing what it's like to work with me and all the different uh, things and how much it costs and all that. There's a way to reach me there. You can even set up a 15-minute consultation. That's widenercoaching.com, W-I-D-E, like the word wide. Ner, N-E-R, WidenerCoaching.com. Or if you're interested in the Speakers Academy, it's WidenerAcademy.com. And let me give your listeners a, a 50% off. Write the word in the promo code SAVE, all capitals, S-A-V-E, and the number 50, SAVE50, all one word. Don't put a gap in between the E and the 5. So SAVE50, and that'll cut the price in half. And again, it's 46 of us doing 63 videos on every aspect of the speaking business you can possibly imagine. Um, And together, the 46 speakers have done a billion dollars in the speaking business. It is the most comprehensive Speakers Academy ever created online. Fantastic. 
Well, Chris, once again, thank you, man, for sharing your wisdom and knowledge. And to my audience out there, I just want to say, always remember, share your passions, express your joy, and be grateful for your profits. We'll see you next episode. Take care.